helpful reminder from Zoom that we are recording. All right, let's get going. Um, so as I mentioned, welcome to the Chicago Marketo Users Group, our first session of 2023. Um, as always, mugs are intended to be a safe space to talk about use cases, ask questions, um, and really have the opportunity to learn from each other. Uh, so we ask that there be no self-promotion or sales pitches during the event and that you not contact people outside of the group um, without their consent. That just helps us to maintain that privacy and trust within the group. So we appreciate your cooperation. Uh, as I mentioned, this is being recorded. Um, so, you know, we do have the opportunity for you to ask questions at the end as well. Uh, if you have to drop for any reason or for folks who weren't able to attend today, there will be a recording uh, going out as soon as the Marketo team is able to help us get that loaded onto YouTube. Um, we'll email that out so that you will have access to it. Uh, today is January 18th. So that'll be uh, probably within the next couple of days here. Uh, if you are here, chances are you probably have already registered through mugs.marketo.com to receive emails uh, through the Marketing Nation uh, users group site, Bevy. Um, if not, mugs.marketo.com is the place. Great thing about that, a lot of events are still virtual, so you do not have to be located in the city where an event is taking place in order to join. Uh, I know a lot of the folks on this call may not be Chicago-based. We're still happy you're here. It also gives you the ability to join in anywhere in the world for any of the groups that are happening. So make sure to check out what's coming up next. Summit. Andy is speaking. Thrilled to have that be one of our sessions for this year. Registration is open. Uh, this will be a combination event, both live and virtual. So if you are not able to attend in person, make sure to register anyway. And shameless plug, Andy, what's your session about? But $2 and a dream will get you. Uh, direction on career paths, building your career, things to do, things not to do, or maybe to do anyway. There we go. All right. And of course, Marketo made that clickable, so I can't really use it as a slide. Let me switch over to my other monitor here. Um, if you need any kind of a business case for convincing your boss, Marketo has one of those um, on the website. It's on the, uh, the summit page. So if you need it, grab it. A couple of upcoming things, um, Marketo and Adobe Analytics and a few of the other platforms have combined to create a better together chapter of users groups. So this is focused on multi-product experience cloud. If you have multiple products already, awesome. Interested in checking out other products, it's a great place to do it. Um, so that is available on Bevy as well. Uh, Marketo is also running a uh, get a gift card for a review. That goes through the end of this month. So if you do a review on G2, you'll get a $25 gift card. So great way to grab a little bit of, I think it's Amazon, Amazon dollars. Um, not sure, but easy way to do that. Uh, certification updates. There has been a new um, Marketo Certified Expert exam that was launched. I believe it's 559 now. Uh, but that went live right at the end of 2022 there. Um, the old associate is still there and the solutions architect exam is now open to anyone, not just consultants. Um, so you will see those in the system. Not sure, Andy, have you heard, is Marketo doing discounts for certification around Summit this year? I would hope so, but I have not heard officially one way or the other. Okay. Keep your eyes out. Sometimes they do do discounts around summit season for certifications. Um, haven't heard anything, can't confirm that, don't hold me to it. But if you are thinking about it, I would say definitely keep your eyes peeled on your email for the next couple of months and see if there's anything um, that comes through. And with that said, I am going to turn this all over to our wonderful guest um, whom we have with us here today. Ashley from Amazon Web Services is joining us to talk a little bit about setting up an always-on data governance center. 
Um, so Ashley, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks everyone for joining today. Please bear with me for a second. I'm not used to screen sharing on, uh, on Zoom. So I'm just trying to get my screen up and running. Give me one second. All right. All right. Can you see my screen and does it say data governance? We're good? Okay. Got it. Can you see my notes section? That's my next question. <laughs> nope. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so um, let's kick this off uh, now that we've gotten that sorted. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, data governance today and um, setting and maintaining and always on infrastructure with data governance. Um, so before I jump in, um, I would like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Ashley Angie. Um, I lead up marketing operations for Alexa Developer Marketing at Amazon, and I am a 2022 Adobe Marketo Engaged Champion. Uh, I've been at Amazon for almost five years now. My tenure started at Amazon Web Services. Uh, back in 2018, where I did digital marketing and then managed a Marketo support program for about 1,600 end users of the AWS Marketo instance. Um, before that, I worked in various email marketing and marketing automation roles within e-commerce, fintech, and publishing. Um, and I've been in the marketing automation space for a little over 10 years now. When I am not getting into the weeds with data management and all the fun that is marketing operations, I like to spend my free time reading, traveling, cooking, and spending as much time as I can outside in nature with my dog when weather is permitting, as I am in Seattle, and as many people know, it rains a lot here. All right, so let's get into the presentation. So um, just a few kind of items that we're going to cover off on today. Uh, the importance of data governance, uh, some common data challenges that marketers face, how to work backwards uh, for data governance, and then some best practices for data hygiene and governance. All right, so I'm guessing uh, if you're here, you probably grasp the importance of data in Marketo. Um, I think anyone who works in the marketing automation space can all agree that data reigns supreme. Um, data is like the lifeblood of what we do in Marketo. When you think about the many things that Marketo does, data is really at the center of it. Smart lists run off of data. Lead scoring runs off of data. Um, CRM system integrations run off of data. Segmentations run off of data. Dynamic content runs off the segmentations with, which run off data. You see where I'm going. Uh, data is really at the heart of everything in Marketo, which means that it is a foundational component to the success of the initiatives that we're running within the platform. Um, given that it's such a linchpin in our success in marketing, it's also likely one of the top reasons that might keep you up at night as a marketer or a marketing operations pro, uh, just because there are so many challenges that are associated with data. Um, so while quality, content, and timing are incredibly important elements of what we do in Marketo, I would argue that data is has the most direct impact on marketing automation and campaign performance because without clean, standard, high quality data, we're unable to reliably and consistently execute on marketing and sales initiatives, which directly impact organizational success. So I'm gonna pause really quick. And I just realized that I did not say this. Um, I'm happy to, we'll have a Q and A um, session like towards the end of, um, of the presentation. So I'm happy to chat through any, any questions then. Um, feel free to drop those into the chat. All right, um, so back to the presentation. Um, data governance, what is it? Why is it so important? Why do any of us care about it? Data governance is the process of managing the available and usable data within your Marketo database in the fullness of time. It's what helps us understand the integrity of our data and allows us to preserve the quality and the security of our data for ourselves, for our internal customers within our organizations, and for our external customers who we're marketing to. 
our baseline for data governance is standards around our data. That means having policies that we set forth to control data entry, formatting, and usage. Having data standards is what ultimately influences our data's reliability in supporting our objectives. We're confident that the sources, if we're confident that the sources of data are legitimate, and we know that the data is being formatted and stored with intention, and we can see the throughput of the data is successfully meeting our objectives, then we can be pretty certain that our data is reliable and sound. So data standards really serve as our rubric for data governance, um, where data standards are our what and our why, data governance is our how. Uh, if we want our data to look like X and Y, then we need to do or implement Z to enable that which makes sense, sounds straightforward enough, right? The tricky part is knowing what to do in scenarios in which your Marketo instance has been lacking standards and governance, and you see how it negatively manifests within Marketo. Um, this can look like discrepancies in database reporting, trouble compiling audience targeting in your smart lists, inaccuracy in the segments within your segmentations, qualifying the wrong leads for sales, emails reaching the wrong people, or conversely, emails reaching the right people, but too late or at the wrong time. So how do we course correct that? That's where data hygiene comes in. Data hygiene is important because dirty data can have a multitude of cause and effect relations between sales and marketing. When data issues in Marketo, like the ones I've mentioned before, aren't addressed, there is a downstream impact. In the fullness of time, it can lead to negative effects on ROI, dead ends in marketing efforts, missed opportunities, targeting struggles, insufficient or accurate reporting mo models, the list goes on. Um, so <clears throat> when we think about data governance, our starting point is the data standards. And then the data hygiene is kind of how we you know, get everything up to snuff with those standards. All right, I'm trying to move on to the next slide. Hold on, I'm having issues. There we go. <laughs> okay, so uh, before we can even begin to strategize what kinds of da data hygiene activities might be necessary to improve the integrity of data within our Marketo database, it's important to understand what issues may be at play that we're trying to solve for. While every Marketo instance and organization has nuance and unique challenges, there are a few common data challenges we often see across different instances and organizations that may hinder data quality. Um, the most common and obvious is incomplete or missing data. And this is a no-brainer, fairly self-explanatory. You know, you try to target people using a specific field in your database only to learn that 40% of records in your database are missing a value for that field. So pretty understandable. Um, the next is not having baselines for how the data is sourced and managed. Um, as I'd mentioned in the last slide, data standards are really the foundation for data quality and data governance, and our baselines need to align to those standards. So when you lack baselines, it can be very precar precarious for database operations, um, and it can inhibit the quality and the accuracy of data because you don't have a reference point or like a single source of truth for verifying you know, the, the data against. Um, as you probably know, there are a number of different data source types and ingress points in, in Marketo. Um, and all of them are interconnected within the database because values are always stored in fields on person records. Um, so if you don't have a handle on, um, you know, those different, you know, data sources and how they're funneling in data that can get messy quickly and it can, you know, a lot of inconsistency can um, be pretty challenging to work through. So, you know, when we think about inconsistent data inputs across sources, an example would be, say, you have an API with um, a first party data source, a form on your website and recurring list imports that your marketing teams are doing. Um, all of these are data sources and in that they're all inputting a data value for, let's say, the country field, for example. Um, but if your API is push pushing a two-digit code into the country field, so like U.S. for United States, and your web form is allowing someone to manually type in their country in the country field, 
And the list imports are not following a consistent format for how country names are imported into the field. Um, that inconsistency will build up. And when you think about it across like a bunch of different fields, um, again, as I said, that gets messy. Um, you know, depending on the volume of a lot of these activities, you could be dealing with a lot of um, inconsistent varying values being stored within a given field. Um, on a related note, unknown data sources are also a challenge and a concerning one at that. Um, so for example, when I started in my role, we had probably, I think it was 15 uh, integrations through LaunchPoint and Webhook. And we had zero documentation on the purpose of that those, you know, APIs serve. Now, in some cases, it was pretty intuitive, like, you know, it was, you know, a, a virtual event platform, like we could deduce that. But um, there were some integrations in place that we had absolutely no idea what purpose they were supposed to serve. Um, you know, we had no idea the cadence that data was getting updated. We didn't know how reliable the data was that was coming in from there. Um, so that's a real challenge when you just don't know, like, you know, where the data is coming from and, you know, how, how reliable it is. Um, so all that to say, you know, thinking about like, you know, what was happening in my instance, you know, we had all those APIs, we had over 400 unique forms across, I want to say like 1300 landing pages. We had no line of sight on whether they used consistent fields, field types, or pick list values for those fields. Um, all 90, some of our users had the ability to list imp to import lists. So that was another issue. You know, we didn't know like who was importing lists. So uh, we really didn't have our arms around all of the data sources in our instance. And so um, that made it super confusing to understand, you know, what was contributing to what. Um, another common challenge that um, you see with data in, in Marketo is just an overbaked data processing architecture with a lot of superfluous functionality. Um, and I, I want to say outright that I don't think that any organization ever sets out to implement a convoluted data processing program. I think it's something that just kind of happens over time um, when we adopt a set it and forget it approach. And, um, you know, we just layer in new processing campaigns and rules over time. Um, and if it's not consistently reevaluated, it can turn into a little bit of a Frankenstein situation and hinder efficiency. Um, so for the example, like with my organization, we had set up a data processing framework. Um, we didn't take a second look at it for almost five years since we implemented it. And when we finally reassessed it this past year, we discovered that there were 88 unnecessary data processing campaigns, which ultimately contributed for about 42% of the overall data processing volume. And those campaigns were assigning values to records in support of objectives that were no longer necessary or relevant. You know, they they served a purpose where we didn't have an integration, you know, pushing data into our system. It would, you know, infer data and it just wasn't necessary now that we had the integration. So um, just like a lot of convoluted data processing. Um, and the last challenge that I think is definitely worth highlighting here is um, I think, you know, pretty much any, any, every Marketo instance is up against is just evolving regulations around data privacy like GDPR. Um, you know, for global organizations that intake and store B2C or, you know, B2B data across different regions and countries, it can be especially challenging because it feels like a moving target. It means different requirements for different locales. Um, and that's just, that's on top of internal business requirements and security requirements, right? Um, so it turns into a huge issue of not just how do I store and standardize my data, but also a challenge of how do I make sure that my, my instance maintains compliance with evolving regulations and internal requirements? It can be pretty tricky. All right. Okay. So um, there's this concept that has, for as long as I've been with the company, uh, been bestowed upon those of us working at Amazon. And that is the concept of the working backwards methodology. Um, Amazon has been at the cutting edge of innovation for decades. And a huge reason for that is this idea of working backwards. 
So working backwards means that we start with the desired customer experience when designing anything, a product, a service, a program. Um, we conceptualize and visualize what our ideal outcome is down to the absolute smallest details. Like we'll write P, like, you know, public re uh, re PR releases for our products to visualize kind of, you know, what we want them to do. We get super, super detailed on exactly what we want to accomplish. Um, and once we get super clear on what we want to do, we use that to inform how we want to do it. So when we think about working backwards in terms of data governance, the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is our ideal output of the data that lives in Marketo? How do we want it to manifest? What do we want it to enable? What do we want it to prevent? Um, and this is where our data standards come in as well. Um, you know, Before we strategize how to approach anything with data governance or data hygiene work, we have to start at you know those standards in that baseline. Um, so once you're clear on what your objectives and your standards for your data are, um, you'll the next thing you'll want to do is just get a better understanding around the foundation of your instance. Um, so I think the biggest thing here is getting super clear on all of your data sources and how data is getting stored over time. So we talked about those as being you know challenges in the last slide, um, but it's really important that we know where our data is coming from, how often, how reliable are those data sources? Do those sources input data that aligns to our standards and our objectives? Conversely, where is there data in our system that doesn't align to our standards and objectives? Why is it manifesting differently from our standards? Um, you know, what sources might be overriding one another? Um, so this, it's really an exercise of just like looking under the hood, so to speak, to understand if there are any outliers in your data, looking for any odd behaviors and records that can't be explained, um, diving deep into anything in your instance that goes against how you think it operates or should operate. Um, and now don't get me wrong, doing a deep dive into understanding the database foundation of Marketo instance can be very cumbersome. Um, my team has spent weeks, if not months, trying to get our arms around exactly that for our instance. Um, you know, many instances have hundreds or even thousands of fields. Um, like for our, for our Marketo instance, for my organization, we have almost 600 fields. Um, and so, you know, so when we think about that, like how can we start to understand our foundation um, in, you know, tacti tactically in a way that's feasible? So I think, you know, it is best to start, start small in that regard, um, just as like a jump off point. So um, if you're clear on kind of which fields are your non-negotiables, like these have to be accurate or these are known problem fields. Um, and then just start pulling some smart lists with some inverse statements, um, you know, corresponding with your standards. So for example, if I have a list of values that are standard values for my organization for the industry field, I would pull a smart list looking at industry is not, and then that full list of values. And then I would, I would look to see the people who show up in that list and then start clicking in to some of those records um, that qualify for the smart list and looking at the activity logs to see what, you know, what those values are, um, you know, what sources are responsible for changing the data values, you know, within that field. Um, and I would do that exact same ex exercise across all of those non-negotiable fields that I mentioned, just to familiarize myself with, um, you know, what APIs, forms, list imports, data processing campaigns might be responsible um, for inputting the data in those fields. Um, so once you've gotten through that exercise, you should at least have some inclination around the different ingress points and um, you know, where what sources may or not, may not be responsible for data discrepancies. And that should help you start to articulate kind of um, or evaluate just operations within your instance. Um, you it's sorry, I just tripped up for a second. Um, you'll want to do an assessment um, just to understand, you know, like, are these things all coinciding well with one another? Um, you know, doing an evaluation of operations in your instance um, should illuminate any inconsistencies or discrepancies. 
so that you can start to formulate that well-rounded understanding of how they all connect and work amongst or against one another. Um, should Doing this evaluation should really help you understand which problem areas pose the biggest risks for data within your instance. Um, so, for example, you know, for my organization, when we were doing this kind of evaluation um, for our for our Marketo instance, uh, we quickly identified that the um, the biggest wound, so to speak, um, was list imports and forms. Um, Though, you know, we didn't have a list import template to standardize how data was imported. We didn't have a, a minimum set of fields for what needed to get imported. We didn't, as I'd mentioned before, we didn't have any rigor around who could do list imports. We didn't have any process around QAing lists before they were imported. Um, you know, we just, we had so much data that was living in our system that just completely lacked any standardization or rigor. Um, and you know, with our forms, as I mentioned, we had a lot of forms across a lot of landing pages, and we saw that the forms didn't use consistent fields. They didn't use consistent pick lists. A lot of fields that should have had pick pick lists were text entry fields. So it was kind of it was a mess. And we recognized we were like, okay, like these are the biggest issues for us mm -hmm. that like we have to get our arms around. Like it's it's not an option. Like we it's a need to have. We need to get our arms around these to to, you know, if you think about like triaging, you know, to stop the bleeding. Um, so after you've done the work to understand just what you're up against and just you've done the evaluation of operations within your instance um, and you understand what the biggest threats are to your data quality and your operations, you should at least have some short list of activities to action on within your instance, whether it's a net new implementation of a governance policy or process, or if it's a data hygiene project that just kind of, you know, does a one-time correction of data. Um, and, you know, based on a combination of known versus unknown risks, estimated level of effort, resourcing, and overall business impact, you'll want to start determining the level of priority, like what gets done ASAP, what can come later or over time, you know, your needs to have your nice to haves and then your your wish list. All right, so as you begin to identify some of the data hygiene work um, or new data governance policies that you want to implement um, just to improve the governance of your database, um, there are some general best practices um, or just considerations that I recommend keeping in mind. Um, the first is that we really, really want to avoid having a set it and forget it mentality when it comes to database hygiene and cleanup and think about it more as um, like an always on approach. So sure, a lot of data hygiene work is a one time exercise to course correct legacy issues within a platform. Um, and, you know, in a perfect world, you know, we automate as much as we can to remove the need for recurring manual work, um, but it will better serve you, your data quality and operational excellence to adopt an always on, on mindset and approach through implementing mechanisms and schedules that allow you to analyze, iterate, and fine tune for optimization. Um, so that means, if you have daily, monthly, quarterly hygiene activities running, um, you know, in the system automatically, you should, we should always be, you know, taking time to assess and optimize operations, you know, reviewing that automation um, to improve efficiency and effectiveness. Another best practice is opting for data normalization, which is the practice of using your data standards to validate what inputs you want on your fields and standardizing the data sets across those fields by changing the existing values for consistency. Um, as trivial as it sounds, this means getting really, really into the nitty gritty details about consistency and formatting. Does this align to AT with my data standards? Are there any special characters or numbers I need to account for? Um, it sounds like a no brainer and easy thing to do, but it's again, it's not for the faint of heart. If there are hundreds or thousands of different values in a single field and you're trying to get everything to snap to that narrow set of fields. 
Um, so for example, um, I know I'd mentioned the country field before, right? Um, you know, for, for my organization, we were looking at data within this field a few months back and, um, you know, even like for a single country, we had so many different variations in our system. Um, you know, for like the United States, we had, you know, we had United States spelled out. We had United States of America, U.S. without punctuation, USA without punctuation, U.S. with periods, USA with periods, like, you know, U.S. of A, like all these different variations. We had, you know, Estados Unidos, you know, the Spanish version of the United States, like, you know, so it was a lot to clean up and, you um, so, you know, all that to say, like, it's really, really important to normalize and, you know, validate, you know, your data um, against those standards. Um, so another best practice to ensure um, data hygiene projects play well with data processing campaigns, uh, or sorry, another practice is to ensure that your data hygiene uh, projects play well with data processing campaigns. So um, it's kind of a moot point to do a bunch of cleanup work to normalize data values or to improve standardization just for them to get overwritten by a random data processing campaign the next day, right? Um, so it's critical that your data processing campaigns align to the same inputs that you use for standardization in your data hygiene efforts and that you know all of the above information is centrally documented. So it can be easily found and any changes to standards can be correctly updated in the operational campaigns as needed. So kind of while we're on the subject of documentation, I do wanna get into that a little bit in the next slide. All right, so documentation. Um, I would argue that aside from relentlessly talking about data standards in this presentation, um, there's another underlying theme across some of the data challenges we've touched on today, and that theme is the importance of documentation and conversely, the negative effects of not having documentation. Um, not having data standards at baselines defined and documented for reference, not having documentation around API is enabled through launch point and how they're pushing data into Marketo, not having documentation around data processing campaigns and the purposes they serve, not having a list import process and template documented, the list goes on. Um, doc documentation is very critical when we consider first establishing data standards, but also in scaling operations and maintaining data standards um, and building upon them over time. Um, it's the number one thing that we can do that will save us time in the long run and will help us more efficiently fine tune data governance operations. It serves as a glossary of contextual and technical knowledge like a single source of truth and is a central reference point that enables us to understand the how and the why of our data hygiene and standards. Um, it's a really vital element of maintaining continuity for pre-existing data hygiene mechanisms reducing duplicative work, and simplifying the process of enhancing your data governance operations. While documentation is certainly not um, sexy or glamorous, um, it's necessary because again, as I mentioned, it gives us that glossary of knowledge. And the sooner that you work on it, the sooner you have a jump off point, um, which makes it easier to manage and iterate over time. Um, also, you know, not just with, you know, it's important to have things documented so that we have a single source of truth, but also having things documented allows us to more quickly understand if there are maybe some process gaps um, or areas that need fine tuning. Um, so like, if you have certain things documented and you're not clear on, well, you know, what is this one area that like, we're just, we're not sure how we're, we're handling this. And you look at the documentation and you realize, oh, well, we actually don't have anything that addresses this thing. That's kind of, you know, having the documentation allows you to quickly um, understand that without having to go through the cumbersome exercises of, you know, pulling a lot of smart lists and um, manually looking into activity logs to understand patterns. Um, sorry, I'm like, where did I leave off? Um, these can get really nebulous uh, when they simply live in our head and actually fleshing it out in the document helps us pick out areas of oversight we may not have previously considered. 
Um, I would say in addition to a lack of automation, um, a lack of documentation is the number one efficiency killer in marketing operations uh, because it leaves teams scratching their heads around like, why the heck was this architected this way? Or do we have any standards or baselines or how did this action occur and why? And is it intentional? Um, you know, and like I said, when these kinds of questions come up, it requires a lot of substantial, you know, time to investigate and reinvent the wheel to address certain things that um, could have just been addressed had documentation been created, you know, from the get go. Okay, so as we near, this is the last kind of slide that I really want to present on today. Um, I want to recap some of the best practices that we teased out um, throughout the course of the presentation for scaling and maintaining data governance in Marketo. Uh, it's important that we understand the overall foundation of how data is entering the system and the interconnectedness of all of our data sources. Um, so that's where documentation is important, understanding kind of, you know, what data sources are updating what fields, um, talking through like the ingress points, how they're interwoven, um, you know, having a color coded map or a flow chart that helps to contextualize the how and the why of the setup um, within your, you know, data foundation that can help you verify consistency across your data entry points. Um, the next thing is, you know, removing blinders or silos. Um, as database admins, uh, we're really owners of data quality. Uh, we're the boots on the ground and defending our data and keeping it clean and safe. So that means that we really have to remove blinders and siloed thinking and zoom out to consider the bigger picture when strategizing how to approach certain data challenges. Um, I think, you know, as humans, we often tend to, to think that uh, things happen in a vacuum and we tackle things in a one-off fashion. But with database operations, um, we have to think about how everything coincides and how, you know, data sources and processing campaigns all work together to enable clean data. Um, and that segs into the next point, uh, which is prioritizing long-term value over short-term gain. Um, so, you know, it's critical that that we always remember that every piece is a part of a larger system. You know, we talked about removing blinders and silos and knowing how things coincide um, together. Um, you know, it's easy to, to default to quick band-aid solutions here and there um, and doing one-off tasks uh, without process or intention just to get things done quickly. Um, but that kind of turns into a death by a thousand paper cuts kind of situation. Um, it's really important that we abide by our data standards and have some rigor around what enter, what data is entering our system and how. And, um, and that we can offer alternative, like or we can say no or offer alternative solutions when stakeholders ask for things that we know can inhibit our data quality um, downstream. And lastly, as I've, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, but really want to drive this point home, um, it's important to, you know, adopt an always on mindset that involves automating, assessing, refining, and repeating. Um, so just really like continually reassessing things. I think the biggest issues that I've seen that have manifested um, in the Marketo databases that I've worked in have been just, you know, things were set up and just not reassessed and then things unraveled um, in the time, um, you know, that it took to finally reassess things. So when we build in these consistent mechanisms that allow us to assess what's happening, refine it, um, it just helps us scale and it, it allows us to move away from having to do these big Herculean effort kind of projects um, at single points in time. And, and it just makes things um, you know more sustainable over time. Um, so that is it. Um, oops, wrong slide. Um, so uh, now it's a Q and A. So, um, I want to open the floor up for any questions that folks might have. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. And I'll look at the chat to see um, if there are any questions that came in. That was awesome, Ashley. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you have questions, feel free to take yourself Thanks. off mute, turn your cameras on, um, drop them in the chat box, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Do we want to stop recording for Q&A so people can kind of feel free to throw whatever out? Yeah, let's go ahead and do.